So, Dr. Gary Fetke, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and what you do today? Um, let's try to summarise a few decades. Well, I'm 60 <laughs> now, so I'm, <laughs> um, I'm a happily married uh, father of three seemingly well-adjusted children. There you are, and a couple of grandchildren. <laughs> we live on a farm in Tasmania, and um, I've been an orthopaedic surgeon for over 30 years, 35 years, I think now. And um, I've been very much involved in the preventative health space for decades. And I, I find that that's actually a more important space to be involved in than, than actually just operating. So 30 odd years ago, I wouldn't operate on smokers because of the potential harm or the problems of that. And I was considered a complete redneck. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the literature was there that, that you know, people who smoked did poorer with surgical outcomes. So I've been in that space and I was in the obesity space, but as time went on, I've been in this more health diabetes, or low carb keto space. And that was born out of the fact that as an orthopedic surgeon, we're seeing the complications of too much weight, poor metabolic health actually coming through on the joints. So people with joint pain, arthritis, tendon problems are all related they're all completely tied up with our nutrition and inflammation in northern tasmania here i ended up uh, looking after most of the diabetic foot complications and uh, my clinic on a friday uh, in the hospital was called fetke's effed up fructose free fungating foot folly fridays there's a lot of f's there <laughs> who I came up with that one there. let's get very catchy um, well, it didn't get much past effed up. Um, and so I'm very proud of the fact that I got all the patients that nobody else wanted to operate on. And so therefore I was literally bombarded each week with difficult patients. Um, my registrar actually gave me a golden toilet brush one year because I got to clean up all the, you know, the all stuff. The crap. But, but the, the important thing about that is it, may be, it meant that for, for years, I've had to actually look well beyond just what you can do with a knife. So if we've got a patient's metabolically unwell, they've got poorly controlled diabetes, poor kidney function, poor attitude, poor mental health, all of those things, then you, you, you're not going to get a successful result. And I looked after most of the deep joint replacement infections for you know, 15, 20 years as well. So again, these are the worst patients in the system in the public hospital system in particular, poor socioeconomic. And all those factors came into it. And so therefore, as time went on, I got sick and tired of literally having to trim people's feet, amputate toes, amputate feet, amputate legs. And sorry, can I just jump in there? Because that was one question I, I had just out of a thought process in the science level. Like, Why does um, diabetes lead to the necessity to potentially have to amputate and take off um, well, all of the I think they're all under the one umbrella. If you have poor metabolic health, the major manifestation that we see that in society now is called diabetes, type 2 diabetes. But effectively, when you create, and that's my, my I, I described a nutritional model of inflammation my, 10 years ago now, where if you combine the, the combination of sugar, refined carbohydrates and polyunsaturated seed oils, you create inflammation. You create it in the cell wall, the mitochondrial wall, and you create it in every blood vessel wall in every corner of the body. So as a result of that, every single portion of the body is affected by our nutrition, which sort of makes sense. And if you create an inflammatory milieu, if the entire body is inflamed, then different organs are gonna be susceptible. Diabetes is a different, you know, it's part of that overall spectrum, but it's quite got quite good, quite specific there. There's a couple of talks of, on YouTube about my, from me, one on diabetes, one's called carbohydrate, the dose is the poison, which is one of my later ones. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm still learning by all this. But if we come back to diabetes, diabetes is the inability, doesn't matter if it's type one or type two, is the inability of the body to manage the glucose, the carbohydrate load that it's presented with. So if you eat carbohydrate, then your body doesn't have the ability to move it around or metabolize it efficiently. 
and then that becomes an insulin resistant state with those in type 2 diabetes. We're getting a bit technical there, mm -hmm. but effectively, every time your blood glucose spikes, it causes damage. And so the body works over time to get glucose out of the bloodstream. Everyone talks about glucose being essential and then for metabolism and all that. And it is essential for some cells, but only a few. But every time the blood glucose goes up, the body, under the effects of insulin and other hormones, actually drives glucose out of the bloodstream and into the tissue. Now, you can only keep doing it. If you've got a high carbohydrate diet, which is a standard American diet, Australian diet, it's, you know, I call it if you eat by the food pyramid, you'll look like the food pyramid, you know, literally. That's being quite kind, so, I think. <laughs> oh, well, you're going to die by the food pyramid as well. But the longest time, we've had this, we've had decades now of, of you know, 50, the recommendation of 50% of our diet to be carbohydrate. That is just way too much for our sustainability. And when you actually keep presenting that over a period of time, the glucose needs to be stored as fat, people getting fatter and sicker. And when that gets overwhelmed, then the blood glucose spikes, and that's called diabetes pre-diabetes if you put it under a bit of stress. Every time your blood glucose goes up, and this is a, you know, this is a term I, which everyone knows, but very few people understand, it's called the Maillard reaction, M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D. It's a cooking term. So when you actually brown your food, that's the Maillard reaction. When you get a piece of toast, a piece of bread, and you put it in the toaster, you heat it up, and it goes brown. That's the Maillard reaction. But what's actually happening there is under the direct effect of heat, the glucose in the piece of bread is combining with the protein and being caramelized. It's a glycation of protein. Now, exactly the same thing happens in diabetes. Every time your blood glucose spikes, this is just one of the effects of a high glucose. Every time your blood glucose spikes, the glucose goes into the tissue combines with the protein and under the effect of body heat, you are slowly toasting your brain, your eyes, your kidneys, mm -hmm. your blood vessels, every corner. And the, you know, the things that the furthest away from your heart with the poorest circulation and the biggest back pressure, particularly if you're obese, are your toes. So those blood vessels get narrower, they get poor circulation, they've got poor immunity as a result of that, as well as the effects of sugar, glucose and fructose. And then all of a sudden you get a little nick or a scratch on your toes. You've got poor circulation. You've got poor healing. You get a low grade infection gets established in there. And, you know, lo and behold, you've set up again, you know, an absolute cesspool at the end of your leg. And unless you address the entire body, it doesn't matter what operation, there's no use me operating and cutting a toe off if there's no circulation there, because then you've got to go further up the leg. Then you've got to take the foot off and you've got to go further up the leg, take the leg off. And I know that sounds all pretty horrible, but that's exactly what I became faced with on a weekly basis, whereas it used to be a rarer occasion. Mm. And so that's when I went back. It, it's, it's root cause. You know, I can't, I'm, we've got a tsunami of diabetes and health complications. Mm. You know, it's just in my corner, it's orthopedics. Yeah. But, you know, it's obesity. It's, you know, all the other things that go with that, that whole scenario. And the simple answer the light bulb moment for me was I had a young guy, I mean, he was in, you know, depending on what people would call young, but he was about 40, with out of control diabetes. And I was considering amputating both of his feet. He had control, you know, out of control infection in both of them. His kidneys were, you know, halfway to being shot. And um, I went into the ward one day and he's eating ice cream. I said, hang on, what... what this is crazy. I'm trying to control your blood glucose and you're eating ice cream. And he said, I was told to have it. Who, by, then, who, uh, by who? The dietitians. The hospital food guidelines here in Australia, and they're, they're no different around most of the Western world, actually recommend these high doses. I've actually got the national food guidelines. I've presented to the national food body and they said, no, that's not right. I said, here are the pictures. Here is the pages from your dietary guidelines that recommend that people including those with diabetes, should be having up to three ice creams per day. <laughs> you know, I'm not kidding. It's, it, it, it's, it's you know, laughable. It's, but it, and this is, and I, and I one of those, um, my, I, I think my second slide for that talk to the hospital food industry, that was their national meeting. I was invited to speak. I wasn't, you know, I was, I, they knew that I was going to come and speak. I said, my, my second slide was hospital food is crap and it's killing my patients. 
Now, the medical board at one point in time investigated that because they said they actually wrote to the hospital to find out how many of my patients had actually died from hospital food. I said, it's a figure of mm. effing speech. You know, it's just a term. If you are setting them up to go home, saying it's okay to have ice cream three times a day when they've got out of control diabetes, you are literally killing them. Um, but yeah, and so therefore, because I started raising the alarm bells that A, hospital food's bad, B, the advice being given by dietitians is absurd, but they're only following the guidelines. I then got this on this thing called social media and started, you know, talking about the science of, you know, of sugar and, and then, uh, then the war started, you know, like literally within 24 hours of being, me being on social media, mm. someone from Coca-Cola was after me. So that, this, this is the, the, this is where the story gets really wild because when at this stage, from what people have heard now, you, you, you're, you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're looking at your patients, you're looking at the science behind what's making them sick, what's making their diabetes worse, what's making them have more amputations. And you're saying, hang on, if we slightly look at the aspects of the diet that we can change, then we can have better outcomes from the patient. And then you start talking about this to people. And that's when the story gets really crazy, right? It, it does. I mean, I, the, the metabolism, so I'll come back to sugar just for one sec to put a time frame on it. Sugar is half glucose and half fructose. And we know quite a lot about glucose. We're still learning about it. I didn't talk about the glycocalyx damage to the blood vessels and what is actually happening with our insulin responses. And I just talked about the Maillard reaction. It's fascinating. We're still learning. But fructose, which is the other half of sugar, was really only definitively described in 2011, 2010, 2011. If you go to all the, the biochemistry textbooks that I, was, I grew up with and, and the students even today, they have very little about fructose metabolism. So I, I read about it in 2010, 2011. Okay, wow, this is, this is the link. This is really fascinating about the inflammatory effects of fructose. And that evolved over a couple of years into that nutritional model of inflammation where we put the sugar, the carbs, and the seed oils together in that infl inflammation model. But so therefore, I'm actually presenting the medical grand round to the physicians, which is quite unusual for a surgeon to actually give a medical grand round about metabolism. So, you know, my colleagues were interested in it and I was being supported by them. But because I started questioning within the hospital system, the dietitians were affronted. They reported me to their national body, <clears throat> the national body. This is, so, this is, you know, because I'm on social media making a noise about it, saying hospital food's lousy. And, it, you know, it's pretty easy. Gary Fetke, oh, he's in Launceston. Okay, that's pretty well directed at the Launceston General Hospital Dietetics Department. But, you know, again, we've got, we've got fundraisers on, on surgical wards which are selling chocolates and lollies. We've got fundraisers on cancer wards selling, you know, cakes and, and stuff. It drives me insane because I mean, that's actually... Maybe you can tell us what, what are the overall tenants of the current sort of nutritional advice that we see in hospitals at the moment? Well, it hasn't changed in decades. <clears throat> Still what are built, the key components? Still, still based around the food uh, pyramid, you know, largely based on 50% carbohydrate. Um, there's just not enough protein mm. in there to actually get patients healed. You know, the, the idea of the hospital giving protein is actually to give protein shakes. It's to give artificial, you know. Um, Which are generally like soy shakes and pea <clears throat> protein shakes. Yeah, and... yeah that, that, they're nutritionally incomplete. Mm. You know, I, I, I was arguing for my patients to be given uh, two eggs and a piece of cheese. Now, I actually prescribed eggs on, my, on the medication chart. They, you know, it, was, it was too controversial. So I said, okay, I want, this is now a medication. And I wrote on, you know, this patient to have two eggs and, you know, you know Good on you. two eggs, Marnay, but, you know, and then, you know, one piece of cheese, but, you know, TDS. Um, and they must have looked day. at you like you're insane. Yeah, I know, but, I, but I, I prefaced it by giving public, you know, lectures within the hospital. And as that evolved, that became public lectures, it became a public platform. And I was just being completely and utterly stonewalled. Um, and then, um, you know, after a couple of years of all of this, I ended up getting reported to the medical board for being dangerous for advising patients in the community not to have sugar. Now, I thought it was a joke. 
but you know, as we backtrack down and we've got, and, and I've been reported three times to the medical board. I've subsequently over five years, it took over five years <clears throat> to be cleared of all that. And I'm actually as innocent, you know, I'm, I'm no angel, but I was innocent of all of that. <laughs> I think you've interviewed Belinda, but she, she'll vouch for the fact that I'm no angel. Yeah, she but, had no no comment, I think she said, on most things. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're still happily married. No, I'll, you know, ask me some questions about her and I'll say no comment. <laughs> but the long and the short of it was um, each time I was reported anonymously by a dietitian, you're able to backtrack this stuff. In, um, and I, as it, and, and uh, one of the times I got reported was for inappropriately reversing someone's type two diabetes on national TV. You know, <laughs> not allowed to do that. I, I got, I, we got rid of someone's type two diabetes, put him into remission over six or eight weeks. And not allowed to do that. Well, you know, when is the off. appropriate time to reverse? Yeah, but, but it, well, as it turned out, it was that I did it. It was inappropriate for me because I'm a surgeon. And I'm not allowed to be doing that. You know. But my argument all the way along with this was my very first degree was MBBS, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. It's a primary medical degree based on biochemistry and science. Every doctor is trained in biochemistry and the biochemistry I'm talking about isn't. You know, it's not in the fine print now. This, you know, this stuff is you know, the, the Krebs cycle, which is how all human life turns fuel into energy is is it, you know it's you know it's in the first 50 pages of your physiology and your biochemistry textbooks it's not it's not even rocket yeah. science and so a lot of this stuff that i've been talking about you know it to me i was going this is a no-brainer you know, we just get rid of sugar and carbs out of the diet we're going to improve people's diabetes overnight literally we get rid of all of you know the, the inflammatory seed oils out of the diet we're going to improve people's health overnight I'm not stupid, but I'm clearly naive. I honestly, I think I said to Belinda early on, oh, this will all be over in six to 12 months. We've got it. Yeah. And here we are, what, 12, 13 years down the track and you know, having discussions about the fact that low carbs, dangerous and keto, you know, trying to defend our turf. And so therefore that journey of me being reported to the medical board, having to present pretty well a PhD on the science and backing all of this up, prompted on the side because i'm just defending my turf and trying to work and you know and it, and this this became quite public because we made it public um and then people are saying it couldn't just be about sugar you couldn't just be talking it must be dangerous and so therefore my practice took a hit for a few years but you know i had my supporters and ultimately the great thing about being an orthopedic surgeon is you're naturally arrogant <laughs> and so therefore on this topic, I knew I was right. And um, I wasn't going to back down. And it, it, it just, it's just, it's just the right thing to do. You know, I literally, you can see people's, you know, I, I, I still get into trouble because if you've got type two diabetes, we can get rid of it, literally start putting into a remission within 24 hours. Mm. You know, I'm still, that's where we're heading at the moment. Well, I'm still presenting that. The, the and, and so therefore, the it's very controversial without drugs. Yeah. The fascinating thing was I actually just for a, for a bit of a, just as out of curiosity, I just searched is type two diabetes um, curable, you know, of which I already knew the answer, but the, the, the first line on Google was type two diabetes is not curable, but the symptoms can be reduced with dietary impact and i was it, it said the symptoms can be eradicated with dietary impact and i was thinking hang on if the symptoms can be eradicated is that not a cure oh this is the whole argument of what, what's cure what's remission what's reversibility um and this this is literally splitting hairs um i saw a great something the other day um <clears throat> so if you've got a we can talk about measurements but if you've got a hba1c of 5.2 and um, uh, your blood glucose is normal, um, you don't have type 2 diabetes. But if you used to have a HbA1c of 7.8 and now you've brought it under control with low-carb keto and it's 5.2, you still have, you're never going to be called cured. Even though you, 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 if, if you, it's literally, 
this is what you know i call this a sickness industry we we mm. like keeping people sick we like keeping people labeled in a box we like having the potential to keep medicating them and mm. and, and um you know with great cynicism i've lost a lot of faith in the healthcare system uh, in healthcare professionals mm. because i think it is an industry where it's much easier to just band-aid sick care we use that term a lot it's, it's much easier just to, here's a prescription on your way rather than actually spend that time, educate people, support them, keep them motivated, keep them accountable. Because ultimately, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see the healthcare model change completely. So I'd like to be paid as a surgeon to not operate. Mm. You know, we, we know a joint replacement, you know, I don't know what it is in the US, but you know, let's say in Australia, standard hip replacement going you know, to cost the system you know, someone's going to pay twenty five, thirty thousand dollars. It's no different. It just gives you know, just parameters. I'd like to be paid five percent of that or ten percent of that every year to not do it. Mm. That's got economic benefits. And quite hard to work out, but the cost, the concept is, and some people have tried around the world that they pay like an insurance policy to a. They pay, I don't know, thousand dollars a year to the doctor, and the doctor's primary role is to not see them. Yeah. And the way you not see them is actually you make them metabolically well. Mm. You keep them, you know, you keep them moving, you keep them eating well, getting the sunlight, all of that. And therefore you don't actually need. So the doctor makes money by making them healthy yeah. rather than keeping them sick. That, that would be an, uh, certainly an improvement, but I think that there's so many issues around sort of siloing of um, specialities. I mean, I spoke to a, a spinal surgeon the other day and his it seems like the minutiae of spinal surgery is around sort of disc healing rates and and other issues in their pedicle <laughs> screws and those are the minutiae that these surgeons are looking at and it's like i guess for, for for yourself it might be like the healing rates of different styles of surgery and but in to get away from that and start looking at nutrition and for instance for this spinal surgeon i was really asking about how his knowledge of biomechanics and muscular strength around preventing joint pain and, and disc bulging. And there really wasn't a huge knowledge base there. He had a little bit of knowledge around chiropractic and how that could help. And he, but he was the same view. He didn't want to operate, but it was like, I'm the last resort for most people. They're in pain. And if they want to go ahead with the surgery, then he goes ahead. But I think it's the siloing of all the information. Uh, well, that, that, that's, that's literally what we're doing most of the time now is breaking down those silos. Um, and a lot of the work we're doing at the moment here in Australia uh, at a guideline level is to get alignment because the, I mean, in, there's in uh, the U S is a society, but society of metabolic health practitioners, it's an international group, but it's U S based SMHP. And uh, I was one of the founding members, very proud of that, but nonetheless, that group have developed dietary guidelines and for the implementation of putting people with type 2 diabetes into remission. That working document is just as relevant for heart disease, kidney disease, spinal disease, osteoarthritis. It needs tweaking. However, um, and it's, it, it's there for Indigenous populations as well, in fact, you know, part of, I've rewritten the dietary guidelines for the world, you know, which is actually becomes incredibly local. You know, eat fresh, local, seasonal, whole food based on your environment and culture, avoiding added sugar and processed food. Really simple. But that's actually low carb. It's low carb keto if you want to go hardcore at it. It's carnivore if you want to go hardcore at it. But effectively, We've got the same disease. We, all we've got, you, you mentioned symptoms. Now, some person, people might have symptoms, which are spinal problems. You know, sometimes a shoulder problem might be a knee problem, might be a kidney problem, might be mental health. As it turns out, they've all got to tie in with inflammation. They're all tied in with metabolic health. Latest data out of the US, 93.2% of the population have poor metabolic health. And you know that, you walk down the street. So what's really interesting, dietary guidelines, US, Australia, UK, are for the healthy population. The trouble is the dietary guidelines determine what food is uh, served in hospitals, nursing homes, 
educated to our children in schools, defence forces, um, uh, and um, and the prisons. So the dietary guidelines are actually forced upon 93.2% of the population in their public health exposure, even though it's not applicable. I think it's a really important, because I'm using that as a wedge at this point in time. So, okay, travel your path of your dietary guidelines, but it's actually a load of nonsense because it's not applicable. So why don't we actually look at specifically specific dietary goals for metabolic health? And let's break down these silos. So, you know, we're currently in the process of working with the Australian Orthopaedic Association on this. We're currently in discussions with the diabetes societies. We, we actually opened the door again with the Dietitians Association mm -hmm. here in Australia. Because to be, even though I might have accused all of these bodies of some degree of stupidity over some point, they're not all stupid people. They've just all fallen for the con. Mm. And that's, you know, that's that whole thing which has unfolded. And, you know, you would have spent some time on that with Belinda. If it's not based on science, so I, I keep coming back to biochemistry because you can't argue with it. You can't argue with the Krebs cycle. You can't argue with life itself. You can't argue with mitochondrial function. If we fuel our bodies well, and fuel ourselves well, and we have a complete nutrient profile, that means a complete profile of healthy fats and healthy, pro healthy proteins, which unfortunately comes from an animal-based diet, not from a plant-based diet. And we have a complete profile of micronutrients and vitamins, which again comes from an animal-based diet, not a plant-based diet. All of that fuels the body perfectly. The moment you start swaying away from that by having ultra processed food foods too high in sugar or an incomplete diet which is comes from a vegan thing then all of a sudden it needs to be supplemented and then as time goes on it needs to be medicated and that's and and that's what is affecting the vast majority of people at least in the western world and we're inflicting this on our on the guidelines of the developing world so the only way to change all that is to say keep coming back to the science and work out the non-science, which is running parallel to it. Mm. And that's when you start working out, okay, who wrote the guidelines? Because we're trying to change them now. And when you actually work out that it's been a con for over a hundred years, then it, it's just, it, it, it's eye-opening, eye-opening smashes your whole mm. confidence in the system, but that's, you know, I've often said, you know, we need to burn, it all needs to burn to the ashes so a phoenix can arise out of it. Yeah. Well, I, I want to go back a little bit to your, once you started making this noise on social media and you started getting hauled in front of the medical board um, and their final verdict on you, which you then had to go and appeal. I believe I, from memory, they, they said you cannot speak about nutrition. You must not. I'm not, allowed, about I'm, not about, I'm not allowed to speak about nutrition because I'm not qualified. And that still stands today, or you, you that's been no, that's all, all everything's been overturned. Mind you, I didn't actually pay attention to them at the time. You know, <laughs> I, I, I did actually put my registration on the line, literally. I said, I'm just, I'm not going to shut up. It's just, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. And I've got it. I mean, I got into trouble because of social media and putting a message out there. But I also have to thank all those people on social media who came to my benefit, my assistance by going loud with it. You know, and that, that, and the same thing goes with Tim Noakes in South Africa, where Tim was in the, and we, our, our cases were running parallel. We were both reported by dietitians. Anika Dahlquist in, the, in, in Sweden, all reported by dietitians to, their, the, to these parent bodies. Interesting, the dietitians all involved in that all knew each other. We've, all, we've got a picture of them together, you know, at one conference in a not dissimilar time frame. You know, it, it, it's not a conspiracy theory if it turns out to be fact, you know, it's really just, yeah. and they were all using the same game plan. And, you know, as time's gone on, there are other doctors here in Australia, which were reported to the medical board using exactly the same tactic. But each time, because I've gone through that, it's now being tossed out. So my winning my case, Tim winning his case, Annika winning her case, literally has opened the door that we can all speak about it publicly now. Mm. Um, you know, and so you know, it's all, it, it's all above board and it, it's, mm. so, you know, I did have a finding against me that said, I'm not allowed to advise patients to on nutrition. More importantly, and this is, and it can't make up this nonsense, but even if this was shown to be best practice, 
in the future, I'm still not allowed to talk about it. And you can you imagine being like, okay, every, this this is the guideline, and now I'm not allowed to actually even do the guideline. And it's just laughable. It's so petty. It's so childish. No, it, but again, when when you go back and now you realize, you know, once we've gone back and it took years to uncover all this stuff, I've been involved in Senate inquiries and presentations into the problems of the medical board into obesity here in Australia. And when it turns out that, in fact, the food industry, and you wouldn't be surprised, the food industry, the processed cereal food industry here in Australia, named me for targeting in 2014 because profits were down in the cereal industry. And the concepts of low carb paleo at that time were to blame. And these were the seven people that needed to be targeted. And I was the only Australian doctor on that list. And we've got the paid receipts between the breakfast cereal industry here in Australia and the Dietitians Association, where the dietitians, and there's going to be some arrangement very similar in the US, were being paid, the only group to be paid by the breakfast cereal industry to promote and protect the benefits of cereal and sugar to the consumers, at the same time that that group's involved in writing dietary guidelines. Now, that's not just it's not just wrong, it's criminal. Because, you know, if I'm right, and that this high carb, high sugar diet is actually behind our health issues, our weight issues, our metabolic problems, then that's criminal. You know, one group has been paid money and accepted it to promote. And we've got the KPIs, you know, the, 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 it's all the, all the data is there, the metrics of what they hope to achieve and the feedback and the, and the systems. Now, all those documents came to us. Um, they weren't, you know, hacked out of the, the internet. You know, thank goodness for society's incompetence. They literally just didn't have them hidden behind any, they literally just fell out of the internet. And so, but that was, that, the, then the penny dropped. Okay, okay, this is not about science. This is about targeting for profits. The chief witness, the major witness against me was you know, a, a really high profile nutritional scientist in the world. You know, he's the biggest in Australia, he's written all the tech, many textbooks, multiple advisory groups, fellow by the name of Mark Walquist, mm. Professor Mark Walquist. Now, well, I'm, I'm just an orthopedic surgeon in this backwater called Tasmania, and we couldn't work out why the highest profile person in Australia came out as the expert witness against me. And it's like, it's like hitting a fly with a sledgehammer, you know, it's literally. Um, and so Linda actually wrote to him because he, because he seemed to be you know, okay. But as it turned out, he had an undeclared interest that he was not, he was working for the breakfast cereal industry at that time. Um, and his wife, as it turns out, uh, is working for Ilsi in, um, which is you know, another site of Ilsi, ILSI, International Life Sciences Institute. Start looking into that and you find out that's the entire corporate food industry. That's their scientific arm to promote the benefits of all the food that they eat. And they have international, they, they literally cross every single country in the world, developed you know, and developing. They are the corporate food industry's um, scientific spin doctoring. Um, so astroturfing. So Oh, at, at, yeah, at, at the kindest word. Yeah. Yeah. And that literally, so he's working at that point in time for the breakfast cereal industry. Um, he, she's working for the corporate food industry. And the medical board came down and said, okay, well, you know, you're clearly unqualified, even though I'd actually you know, tried presenting this case. Because to be fair, I, I, as I said, I honestly thought this, they, this was ridiculous. They're going to be, they're going to throw it out. And then I got reported again. And then I got reported again. And I got reported on a talk that I was going to give. Before you'd even but given it. Before I'd even given it. That was again <laughs> to the second one of the hospital food industry. And so the medical board then actually wanted a copy of my talk before I gave it. And so I actually wrote to them and said, could you just clarify, do you really want a copy of my talk before? Because I've got it in writing, black and white. And they said, yes, we want it to actually edit, you know, assess it. So, okay, now I've got you. Now you are now editing free speech. You know, mm. And all of this has been presented to Senate inquiries and it's actually called, you know, part of that, 
I was a central witness in it, has meant that there's been a reassessment of the, the whole medical board process, what we call APRA here in Australia. So you know, I, I'm sort of proud of the fact that I've had to take that on the chin or literally carry that weight, but we've been able to invite some change in how the whole process has gone. Mm. But it came at it, you know, you know, a personal financial family cost, all of that. But the long and the short of it is, I was right. You know, we, we, <laughs> we, we can improve people's health by changing their diet and nutrition, and we can change it by not following the guidelines because the guidelines have been corrupted mm. by food industry and religious. It, um, it, it's really quite incredible when, when you start looking through the lens of what is actually making people healthy versus what the advice is, because oftentimes I will now start, you know, advising people to increase. I, I'd always sort of advise people to increase the protein in their diet, but now it's becoming far more apparent that animal products specifically are the way to go in terms of protein and fat and everything in between. And once people, it's very hard to break down that dogma, even when you're advising, because they expect they come to a nutritionist and they expect the nutritionist is going to advise them to eat more vegetables and eat more plants um, and reduce meat mm -hmm. consumption. And you kind of tell them the exact opposite. And then once they start experiencing the changes, which as you say, happen very fast, then the 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 curtain starts to raise for them as well so i can see why it's a priority for these big companies to try and stop people seeing behind that curtain i it, it's when you know when a, a, not so much now but if we go back several years you could see another another doctor work it out and it's like a grief reaction they go through there's an angry phase like blend or they go oh He's in the angry phase now, <laughs> <laughs> or she's in the angry phase mm -hmm. now. And I, I, I won't mention names and the name drop around because because we because we were in the angry phase, and mm -hmm. and then you go into what you know, what how do you get out of that and move into the productive phase and go through it? When nobody likes realizing that they've been conned, and if it's been conned and it's come at a personal cost to you, of your health, and my health was clearly related to the way I ate, and I'm I'm. I'm you know, I'm older, but I'm healthier now than I used to be 20 years ago. I'm 20 kilos less than I used to be. I used to be, you know, so what's that, 45 pounds lighter. I used to have pre-diabetes and high blood pressure. And um, you know, The only trouble with all this stuff is it, it, I can't, it can't improve your looks. You know, I'm sorry about that. No, I didn't see. I haven't seen what you look like 20 years ago. Maybe you're doing well. No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I'm still aging, okay? But the... We've apologized to our children because if you realize that you've in fact been giving your children the wrong fuel, now we, our grandchildren, it's really interesting, they're, they're growing up low carb, they're not keto, they, 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 you know, they're not, it's not very hardcore. And all I can say, you know, apart from being a proud grandparent, they're healthy kids and they're achieving well. And that doesn't count as a study, but all I can say is that they're meeting avoiding all the processed food and the sugar and, and the carbs and whatever, um, you know, I, I, they are healthy and it's not doing harm. Now, I, and, I, and we can backtrack this and I get hundreds, thousands of stories of children being raised in this way. In fact, the developing brain, the developing child in the embryo and that newborn infant actually thrive in ketosis. So in fact, you actually need to be in that state. Um, I did that as a talk for um, because our daughter was, you know, had a lot of morning sickness in her uh, in the last pregnancy, and so she, you know, she was clearly in keto, in ketosis, nutritional ketosis. It wasn't ketoacidotic, which is a totally other end of the spectrum. And so I started looking at that from a, what a great experiment to actually think about. So that most important developing time of life is actually when at an embryonic level, particularly the first trimester, when women are most sick with morning sickness. And um, so I started researching and realizing that we have incredible, there's tens of thousands of results in the literature on the results of morning sickness. And by definition, morning sickness is ketosis. 
And by definition, that is the most important time of development of a child. If you're ever going to do a medical experiment to work out if nutrition is good or bad, what you should do it is on de developing babies, shouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You'd never get it past an ethics committee. No, not not at all. But I'm I'm curious. Can you t so so you, by definition, morning sickness is ketosis. So can you explain that a little bit for me? Because I'm. But if you I'm, don't eat, yeah. If you can't eat, you you're not getting ketosis. food in. You're going to be in a fasting state, mm. and in fasting state, you move from a, a carbohydrate metabolism into a, a a ketone metabolism, and you you move into ketosis. Mm. And it's like, it's, you know, it, it, it's all hidden in plain sight. It's actually all there. So I started looking at the literature, put together a talk. And as it turns out, the more severe the morning sickness, the old wives tale is you can, kid, the baby's going to be fine. Well, guess what? The literature well and truly supports it. That <clears throat> morning sickness is actually protective of the baby in comparison to the other end of the spectrum, which is gestational diabetes, which I realize is often more towards the end of second and third trimesters. But nonetheless, the outcomes are, are, are chalk and cheese. So if you're in key, if you've got more bad morning sickness, the child is more likely to get through to full term. It's more likely to be healthy. It's not more likely to be a normal weight. It's less likely to have congenital defects and it's more likely to have a better health and less learning difficulties. Take so, the so, other end of the spectrum. Sorry. So, because, I mean, I've, I've, I'm not a father yet, so I haven't gone through the process of pregnancy with you're, a, you're with not a, likely to get morning sickness. No, no, right? no I hope not. <laughs> Unless I start feigning it. So I don't have to make yeah. breakfast, but um, so, but this morning sickness that, that women get, it's to stop them eating and to keep them in like a fasting state that they, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Mother nature, you know, to be fair, a lot of, you know, the majority of women get pregnant in their twenties. Let's make it. I'm making a big generalization here. Okay, my arms are going out here. Okay, do not. I'm not being sexist. Okay, majority of women in their twenties. Now they might be in a partying mode. They might be, you know, having a bit of alcohol, not eating that well, might be smoking a bit, whatever. All of that sort of things. They get pregnant, and Mother Nature's thing is, I'm going to give you morning sickness. I'm going to get you to get rid of all the crap in your diet. I want you to improve, improve yourself. You're not going to be able to go out partying because you're feeling sick. I'm going to put you into ketosis. And guess what? That is actually the best environment. I call it like hitting the, the safe mode on operating system on a computer. Wow. Whenever the, the system gets into trouble, it will move into safe mode. Safe mode is ketosis. It's the time, and, we, and this is not just in babies, but it's the time when you, 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 you get rid of those those um there's autophagy you've heard that term which actually mm. clear up the body the, yeah. you know, the bad cells in the body fasting is seen as a time of ketosis when we go into a cleansing state and our bodies recycle those damaged cells so um one of the fascinating it might do it at the expense of some of for the mother of some you know if she's not eating well and uh, but it's amazing how if you give the developing baby will find the nutrients from the mother and the state of ketosis is protective. Whereas those people with diabetes, poorly controlled blood glucose, the babies are more likely to miscarriage, more likely to get preterm or long-term. They might like to be high weight, birth weight or low birth weight. They've certainly got more congenital abnormalities, particularly those development ones like um, cardiac rather than chromosomal. And the more likely to be obese, more likely to have learning difficulties. It's all being studied. Tens of thousands wow. of, of women have been studied in both of those categories. And now I'm extrapolating that two extreme states of saying, okay, one is a state of ketosis mm. and the other state is a poorly controlled blood glucose. Um, and I'm not just saying high blood glucose, but there'll be lows in there as well. So it's fascinating. So, I didn't need to do the study. I didn't need to go past an ethics committee. I literally put together the data, which is already there, and just do, drew two assumptions. And and what's your? Because I was speaking to another lady called Sarah Kleiner, and she's been in the sort of low carb um, space and carnival space for a long time. And she she's seen a lot of people starting to have in long term ketosis, starting to have some issues with thyroid function. Have you seen or heard anything in, in that or have any advice oh, look, on that? I think if you're going to do anything, you've got to do it in a well. So I think um, 
here in Tasmania, for instance, we don't have enough iodine in our salt, in our, in our, in our soil. So therefore, it doesn't actually get into the plants or it doesn't get into the animals and the whole cycle. So here in Tasmania, we have a relatively iodine deficient state. So you've got it. So I, I do recommend to people if you just you might want to use a bit of iodized salt. We've got a great product here. I'm not I'm paid for anyone, but Tasmanian sea salt. But they it comes out of the ocean. But I got them to check to see whether or not it's got iodine in it. So I think you. A bit like magnesium as well. I, I, I'm fascinated by this as well because our agricultural practices are such that we, uh, if we if we fertilise our soil, particularly potassium in the soil, that in, in fertilisers that actually binds to the magnesium in the soil, and the magnesium can't get into the grass, can't therefore can't get into the animal, can't get into the plant, it can't get into the vegetable. So we're not actually so we're virtually all across the world having a, a low magnesium diet and the same thing i think goes with iodine i think it's just um one of the arguments is that with thyroid function is that if you actually reduce your carbohydrate intake you are not requiring as much uh thyroid hormone so therefore you might see that there's actually a reduction in those thyroid levels and that may not be actually harmful. It may be a product. So people say, oh, you've got thyroid dysfunction. When in fact, maybe everyone in the world at the moment on a high carb diet has thyroid dysfunction, but we've just measured it differently in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I think if you're going to eat anything, you want to be eating still across the spectrum. I talk about those to tail in, in eating animals. You've got to respectfully but we need organ meats in there a lot of people don't like that organ meats are, you, know, I, you can get you know whether or not we, i call it super meatballs or keto meatballs you get your mince and i get a bit of liver minced up and you mix it in there so people don't want to eat lots of liver but you just mix it up put it in your meatball um most people like a bit of pate mm. so i've got a germanic background so I, yeah. you know, i'm always <laughs> down there getting a bit You're of always liver washed always happy on the on the meat-based diets for germans yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> um so I, I i've heard about it. i think we'll find out a little bit more over time mm. but i don't think it's just a pro i think it if you if you're still going to get all your micronutrients yeah. um my thyroid function is normal by the way and so is blinders you know whoops i've let out medical secrets on it <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't but, worry uh, i'm not going to try and use it against you <laughs> oh no no but it, it's and so we've been in this space for a long time um i'm not so uh again it just doesn't cure everything i mean I, I i use another analogy most people take pay more attention to what fuel they put in their car than what they put in their body you know you won't put diesel in with your petrol you won't put petrol in with your diesel mm. and but even if you know, if you fuel your car perfectly, it's still going to get into trouble. It's still going to wear out. It's still going to have problems. It's just going to get wear out and get into more problems earlier if you keep putting the wrong fuel in. Yeah. So uh, thyroid's part, you know, possibly in that thing. So I'm not denying it. I'm just mm. going. I mm. don't think we know enough about this at this point in time. Interesting. And and there was something that you said to me at the, the start, just before we started, you know, and you, you said that, you know, it's always good to get out of your echo chamber because for, for, for myself and you've been in this space for, for much longer than I, and many other sort of carnivores, people in keto in, and low carb space, like we kind of know that animal products are the most nutrient dense. They're what can make the, what humans run best on, et cetera, et cetera. And we think, hang on, the message is getting through but it still seems to be this full steam ahead on this plant-based revolution and lab grown meats and plant-based burgers and not just about nutrition, but about sustainability. I mean, do you see this slowing down or like, no, I don't. It, 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 they have to actually, they can't, they can't win on nutrition. So they've got to, they've got to use other rhetoric and, uh, They've also got advertising dollar and investment dollar and startup dollar because that's where people feel this has got to go. So you're quite right. They're using, they're not, they can't win on sustainable health 
because it's not proven and all that happens is you know the more you look at it it doesn't win um i use it uh it's lots of different things i can get paths i can go down um uh, I, I have I have given a couple of lectures to the meat industry here in Australia, and I've, I've actually the, the last time I spoke with them publicly, I, I spoke just after their lunch, and gave a plenary talk about essentially waking them up to actually who's, you know, the vested interests, the non-science that's going out there. But I said I was incredibly disappointed in them because it was a meat industry national meeting. And I'd come from the, the dining area and they had a table of vegetarian food. And I, it was a WTF moment. I, and I, I let them know publicly. And they said, oh, it's just the caterers. I said, you wouldn't go to a vegan meeting and get, you know, meat, you know steaks on the side. It just mm. wouldn't happen. And so everyone talks about the, the, the meat industry being strong and powerful. They are like a bunch of herding cats. Mm. On the whole, the meat industry, sure, there may be big players in it, they're generally just farmers who are trying to do the right thing. So, yeah, in Australia, we've got at least 13 different groups representing the meat industry. The processed food industry here, we take the breakfast cereal industry, the four major players, Nestle, Freedom, uh, Sanitarium, um, Kellogg's and Sanitarium, uh, uh, literally sit down at a golf club every three months and have lunch together. The four and and uh, and when we talk about they just the cereal industry. However, their tentacles are right across. Them. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. with the head of the national of the um, the food board is the other member. They mm -hmm. sit down and have lunch together and talk about tactics. So therefore, they are all colluding. Now, I, I, I've got the minutes of their meetings. Okay, so it's not I'm not making this stuff up. So it's they are highly organised and they can decide on which way the whole process is going to go. Um, to diverge slightly, we have I think the breakfast the cereal we've got them on sugar, you know, sugar cereals high in sugar. We've now got them on carb because high carb people are, in Australia you can buy low carb beer. I'm winning. You know, by definition, I can go to the, go down to the grog shop and you can buy low carb beer. Mm. So this message is getting out there. You can actually buy cauliflower rice. You can buy zucchini noodles. You know, at the supermarket, already freshly packaged. So the low carb message is getting there. The last bastion of defence for the cereal industry is a thing called fibre. Mm. There's enough work out there now to say that fibre is not essential. Best of example of that, come back to babies, babies poo. Mm. You know, they're thriving and growing. And they, 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 I can realize there's a tiny little bit of cellulose in, in, in breast milk, mm. oh, not uh, uh, non digestible cellulose. What is it? It is a tiny little bit of carbohydrate. Mm. But they're pooing out frequently. And I dare anyone to go and look at a baby's nappy. There's nothing wrong with that, that, that poo. And they thrive on a zero carb diet. Mm. So in Australia, a couple of years ago, the, the Deputy Health Minister, David Gillespie, gave a media release talking about that the Australian population needed to eat more cereal because of its fibre content. If you go to that press release, at the bottom it was uh, gratefully written by Kellogg's. So we've got our National Health Minister, or a Deputy Health Minister, giving a media release written by breakfast cereal industry now so therefore you know that okay government dollars you know they've got to get their advertising they've got to get their you know, their money from somewhere but we shouldn't be having uh here in australia again the, the medical practice if you go to your general practitioner your, your, your local doctor on their computer there are two computer operating systems medical director and best practice are the two here in Australia, if you go to the resource material, so if you've got a headache, you've got constipation, you've got diabetes or kidney disease, you can go to the resources and the resources have been kindly supplied by Kellogg's and Sanitarium, Very which are breakfast them. cereal companies advocating for an anti-animal based diet and promoting their product, having more cereals and grains and vegan vegetarian. So you know, a busy doctor is going to reach for a resource on their computer, one click, print, 
give it to the patient out the door, not realizing they're just supplying propaganda from the food industry. Mm. The, the the problem is is that, that that it's so insidious and it's so sort of sinister that it's so entrenched. I mean, I, like there's nutritionists that I know that still espouse to not consume animal products or especially avoid meat because it causes colon cancer. I mean, that's the that's the sort of trotted out line. And it's many people go who are in poor health and they're going to someone who they think is an authority in the in the field, whether it be a doctor or a nutritionist and saying, look, help me. And they're given advice that is hurting them. Correct. I, it, it's like an awakening, you know, um, it's an awakening for the health professional to realize that their education is being conned. There's a talk again, another talk of mine on YouTube called the failure of medical education, where I, I go into that both at a medical one, because that happened in the Flexner report in 1910, where effectively we got rid of holistic healthcare and healing. And we just started medicating and operating in the whole birth of the, ph the pharmaceutical industry. And 1917, with the birth of the American Dietetics Association, which was then model used the model used around the Western world. But that was effectively started by the breakfast cereal industry and the corporate food industry who were all there right at the beginning with advertising booths. And, but their origins were with the Seventh-day Adventist church, which is the whole vegan vegetarian movement, breakfast cereal industry, soy industry of the world, or started the alternate meat industry. I can just go, you know, mm -hmm. wrap it on, but I, you know, you've interviewed Belinda about that. So effectively we had the Seventh-day Adventist church and the corporate food industry developing the dietary guidelines for the Western world, developing world since 1917. My textbooks have been being written by the pharmaceutical industry since 1910. And so when you realize that everything's been compromised, you've only got one spot to go back to, which is biochemistry. Mm. Uh, you know, like the whole rhetoric about food being bad for the you know, meat causing cancer is actually based on really bad science. And if you actually go to the, the, the whole 900 page report, of it, it didn't actually say it. The headline was meat causes cancer. Meat causes colorectal cancer. If you go to the hundred page summary, it says, well, in some populations, which were had, um, which was exposed to with higher rate, uh, high rates of high processed red meat, there were higher rates of cancer, of bowel cancer. However, those were also, if you look, take apart those papers, those populations have had a more sedentary lifestyle, ate more junk food and were more likely to smoke. Well, hang on. If you then go to the whole 900 page document and actually start reading it, it doesn't say it at all. It says that if you're in Asia, you're not likely to get cancer, colorectal cancer. If you, um, the more, uh, again, it's the, the European paradox, there are whole areas which actually have very low rates of colon cancer. Uh, all of that stuff about cancer and nutrition fails on Bradford Hill criteria. Bradford Hill criteria is a, is a spectrum of questions you need to ask, but effectively you need to find at least a two times higher rate of association between the food and the cancer. And at the best, meat causing colorectal cancer is a 1.12. And I put that into, into conversation because little known fact, if you're male, you're 1.2 at the age of 70, you're 28% more likely to get bowel cancer than if you're female. Wow, is that true? Wow. If you're a smoker, you're 50% more likely to get bowel cancer than a non smoker. They both failed Bradford Hill criteria. But, you know, the couple of poor studies that said it was up to 12% higher rates. That's not 12% of people getting bowel cancer, up to 12% higher rates of colorectal cancer, up a low number, mm. is a dra dramatization of association risk. So what I, my argument, you know, and I say it is, look, if you really want to stop getting bowel cancer, uh, you should um, uh, stop smoking. You should uh, move to Asia and you should have a sex change. Yeah. And so there that's, you go. Tick that's, those boxes. And, and, and so it's far more likely to prevent you from getting bowel cancer than not eating red meat. It, it's, it, it's literally... But because the processed food industry, it's 
it, it's like highly processed food. It comes in a package. It has shelf life. It has profitability. It's also got full of all sorts of chemicals. Carbohydrate is safe storage. You know, you can put it in a packet and it will still be there. Animal-based product has a shortened storage life. It needs to be refrigerated in the majority of cases, and therefore it's a higher unit cost. It's got higher, it's got less profitability. And therefore, you know, who, who's who's here to make money? Well, all of these big companies. It's, it's the processed food industry. Yeah. So their idea is to demonize and marginalize as much of, of their 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 uh yeah you know, and the, the whole anti-meat sentiment has literally come from the processed food industry based on religious ideology mm. so good old lng white who was the prophetess of the of the seventh day adventist church oh this is where meat meat's bad for you the, mm. and their the whole i you know and again not making it up their whole aim is that once the world turns to vegetarian veganism then christ will return for the savior of 144,000 of them and everything only 144,000. Only 144,000. There's it's 18 million of them in the world. And everyone thinks, oh, who's the Seventh day Adventist church? But nonetheless, you know, they are the second biggest educator in the world after the Catholic church. Their right arm of the church is medical evangelism. They are, they are the ones who write the dietary guidelines. They, are, they started the cereal industry of the world, the Western soy industry, the alternate meat industry the stevia industry they're completely entrenched in it completely cashed up and they're pushing this rhetoric but ellen g white her original thoughts were and again back to temperance movement mid 1850s 1860s people were moving into the cities water quality was bad so they started drinking more beer and alcohol because that was why so therefore everyone got their vice started going up a bit meat that was coming into the cities wasn't refrigerated so it was actually sort of poor quality it got heavily salted our fear of salt i think is partly related to that but she came out and said that first of all meat meat causes violence meat causes masturbation which is the vilest sin meat causes cancer all starts back in 1860s 1870s but that meat causes cancer. I think might have been we think might have been it causes cancer of the soul, but it's morphed into meat causes cancer now. Then, as we progressed on, because that wasn't winning the war, but then we've got meat causes heart disease in the early part of the twentieth century, and then you can't call it that. So then, saturated fat becomes cause heart causes heart disease, and then we've been back on this rhetoric that meat causes cancer again since the early 90s in particular. Therefore, we've got to go to fruit and veg. And now we've got meat causes environmental damage. And when you take apart all of those over 150 years, they all completely fall down. So the meat causes environmental damage. I mean, I've got a, a three-page sheet of which Peter Ballastat gave me. Okay. Mm. How to debunk each one of the arguments in one line. You have to send that now, to me. A, pardon? Yeah, you have I, to I send that to me. <laughs> with a reference, because it's just, I said, you know, Peter's a fabulous guy. And I said, this is brilliant. I mean, and you can build upon it. Um, one of my favorite books I've given to, to um, politicians is um, uh, Cows Will Save the Planet. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't seen that. No, I, I've, it's a great yeah. book. And the great the reason it's a great book is it's actually written by a vegan lawyer and she's a farmer. So therefore well referenced and, and it's, it, you know, um, cows will save the planet. I think mm. it's a great book um, because it's being written by someone who should be in the other camp. Yeah. And so therefore, um, there, there are lots of books that, you know, there's so much research about it, you know, you know cows, you know, with, um, here's a little, a little tidbit of information. Which are the biggest producers of methane in the animal kingdom? I don't know. They account for nearly a third of the methane on the planet, you know, from know. the animal kingdom. Tell me. Termites. Termites, really? Termites. On the tail, they've got a little bit of a couple of little organisms that produce methane. So termites wow. are actually the biggest producers of methane on the planet. Okay, we never hear anyone talking about let's kill all the termites. 
you know, and then we had more ruminants roaming the globe, cows, sheep, goats, etc. you know, 100 years ago than we have now. Belinda and I were driving, I was coming back on a family trip a couple of years ago in, North, in southern Queensland. Uh, and, we'll go, and there was a massive traffic jam. It was three lane highway both ways. And the cars were backed up by 20, for 20 kilometres, like literally, we mm -hmm. were crawling along. And on the side of the road was this massive paddock, you know, let's say you know, 100 acres. And there were four cows in there. And I went, oh, they're the cause of climate change. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't be these cars backed up it's madness. for 20 kilometres. I found the madness. four culprits. Let's get out of the car, run up to them, knock them off. Oh, it's just. And then we're saved. Uh, it's, um, it's madness. I think another one of those books that I've, I've got in my reading list is Sacred Cow. Um, yes, I think by book. Rob Wolf. Um, and he's going to come on the podcast as well. And um, I'm also at the moment, I'm reading the great plant based con. Um, yes. And that's, I mean, it highlights everything that I was sort of starting to know, but the levels of it are just so far reaching. And so many, it's so easy for cows to become the scapegoat for so much of what 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 is ailing the world you know the chemical industry and and you know shipping and other carbon emissions it's very easy to point the, the, the cows are the the ruminants are the ones which are literally farming carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and into our soil and improving the quality mm. that animal-based agriculture moves carbon and nutrients into the soil plant-based agriculture takes it out particularly commercial farming practices you know, the biggest export in the world in the agricultural sector is topsoil um there's a great book called the erosion dirt the erosion of civilization um montgomery right, i think um and we can actually, we, we just history repeating itself. You know, the fall of the Roman Empire was largely based on its inability to feed its people because of their cropping practices and loss of topsoil. Really? Wow. Um, uh, Jared Diamond's written about this, a book, great book called Collapse. He wrote about, I don't know, 25 years ago. And so the moment a community actually outstrips its resources, then we're going into it, you know, it's like drawing down on your capital. You're going to run out at some point in time. Now, as time goes on, we've only got one planet. And I, I'm a great environmentalist, but let's do it smart rather than actually doing it stupid. And by getting rid of the cattle, and you know, we've got an ability to, to graze our, farm, our, our grasslands. Here in Australia, it's a bit like California, there's massive bushfire risk. Mm. The, the National Farmers, uh, the National Meat Livestock, Federation here in Australia have a proposal to put cattle into the into our national forests, not overgraze them, just graze out the undergrowth, mm. cut down the fire risk. That's that, that's smart planning going yeah. forward. But everyone says, "Oh no, you can't have your cattle in there." But, mm. it, but in fact, that's the way out of this, rather than actually saying. The, the huge argument I always hear, though, is is um, all of nearly all of the monocropping of soy and these other huge monocrops is going to feed animal agriculture well, well it's not the vast it, it, it again people can start drag and, and people will say the same thing about me that i'm going to drag you know one statistic from here or there or whatever but you know our, the cropping the, the, the forest harvesting in brazil from my understanding is not the food from that doesn't actually go towards you know feeding the monoculture and i'm not a i'm not a believer in feedlots mm. okay and i think but we've got the ability you know, our arable land is only four percent max of the planet our grasslands 20 percent, which has been completely underutilized mm. the vast majority of our arable land is not actually of those of those grasslands is not suitable for agricultural practices for plant-based foods let's move on to that let's eat let those animals eat the grass take the carbon dioxide out of the air put it back into the soil and actually become a far more sustainable option mm. uh the um 
where was I heading on that? Um, I've got a little bit of a blank, but well, well, the, uh, well, something that springs to my mind in there is that we hear so often about the 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 emissions impact of agriculture or even shipping or cars or transport, people telling us we can't drive our, our car a certain amount of distance, we need to have climate lockdowns and all of this crazy stuff that's postulated. But never do I hear the stat, which is totally correct, that healthcare emissions, emissions from hospital mm. care and, and, and you know, the pharmaceutical industry account for 10% of the US emissions. And that's, that was in 2019, I think. So that is rising. And you think about if we take away animal-based products from people's diets, that's going to be more nutrient deficiencies, more illness, more metabolic mm. issues. That's more for the for the health industry to deal with or for the sick care industry to deal with. That's more emissions. I mean, like, but we never hear about the scale of health care emissions or sick right, care it, emissions. It's, it's at least 10%. I've heard the same figure. Um, whereas if you change the whole animal agricultural sector, it might change it by 1%, 0.5%. Mm. Uh, there are bigger fish to fry than, than cows. And, and those, but they, they are industries that want to protect their profitability and their position in that space. Well, well exactly. That's, that's coming from an actual logical sense <laughs> rather yes. than this, this like profit driven, we need to stop people attacking our interests. So I, I keep, whenever it comes to a situation, I say, well, you know, out the window here, you can't see it. I've got the, the chickens and we've got some sheep and the next door Beautiful. neighbor's got cattle. And I go, you really think that's causing climate change when you, you, your, your beast of a car is going up and down? Um, look, it's completely arse about, you know, but nonetheless, all you can do is keep educating and informing people and saying your choice but don't don't if it comes out of a guideline i can guarantee you that guideline's been mm. written by vested interests yeah who and don't I, have your interests and, and, and the I, government i'm sorry they for all their rhetoric mm. the politicians might say they have your interests but i can tell you one layer down from that is about keeping everything you know where it is yeah and that's yeah. not that not your interest. That's self interest. That's a, that are there. Yeah, and I I think at, at some point you you look at I mean doc, I think his name is Dr. John Ioannidis, and yes, doc, he, yes. and he's written papers set, like just showing how obfuscated and crap the research is out there. And so like you've mentioned with these epidemiological studies and self reported nutrition studies, and the fact that most people don't understand how to read this new research in the first place, or properly critically analyze it. And you start rolling back to okay, let's go back to like you've said the, the biochemistry, but also what's the anecdotal evidence, which people always dismiss, like, what is actually helping people be healthy, you know, is people taking on an animal based diet, becoming healthier, like you've got example after example after example after example of people reducing the carbohydrates in their diet and getting great health outcomes i mean it, at some point you have to say look the, a lot of this research is too muddy and it's too too obfuscated with interests so where do you turn you turn to the people who are getting real results i call that the n equals one group um I've, one of those projects is this thing called i've got to keep have another crack at is called the n equals one study where we develop a, a platform which was all sort of happening before COVID, but because it was a couple of us involved from around the world it sort of fallen on its ear um but the n equals one study is that where i have you come along with your n equals one story and you put your data in because people want to share their data and then all of a sudden we have fifty thousand people have put their type 2 diabetes into remission slash cure um, diabetes.co.uk did that and um, uh, the uh, the people who run it they, they actually did a study where they looked at 80,000 people who went low carb over a three month period and I said to them how did you get that past ethics committee so we didn't do it you just literally got people to put 80,000 people Wow. No, no reported deaths of which you know, the vast majority of them improved their diabetes outcomes. 
Now, you can't argue, as you're quite right, that's 80,000 anecdotal stories. Mm. And as I went back, you know, coming back to the, um, you know, uh, morning sickness, yeah, there are tens of thousands of results there showing that ketosis in the most critical time of life is safe and actually optimal. So again, we've, and people say, oh, that's not a controlled study. I go, yeah, but it's, it's, it's 50,000 anecdotal N equals ones, you know, just, I, I'm, 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 essentially I'm getting old and cranky. I said, look, it, it, just, okay, you don't, you don't have a, you don't have to agree with me, but can you just get out of my way? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that, I think I've, you know, I've got the privilege of a bit of age, but I think I've also got the privilege that I've copped a fair amount of whack over this over time. And the trouble is we're getting people healthier. Now I'm not saying we're going to cure cancer. We're not going to cure every condition on them. But if you can move people from a position of poor health and multiple, multiple medications, and you can de-prescribe and actually improve their health and they lose a few kilos and they improve their their mental health and they improve their sleep patterns and they get out and do a bit of exercise and get a bit of vitamin D. Wow. Mm. You know, and I, we, I, you know, here's, you know, if, I think if 90% of people did 90% of what we're going to said, the 90% of the problems are just going to improve overnight. Mm. That's why diabetes, you know, is the, is the interesting, because I, you can, you can get them, you know, most places now called those continuous glucose monitors, those discs that you can put underneath the skin, how you get hold of it, maybe a little bit tricky when where you are, you might have to tell occasional white lies to get hold of them. Mm. But literally by putting a disc on and you have a continuous glucose monitor, you completely individualized healthcare to yourself to find out what food does to you when you eat. Mm. I've got a proposal, you know, we keep trying to put this proposal into different hospitals around Australia. You know, there are people, the low carb advocates in those hospitals who, you know, I'm, I'm not alone here now, who actually, I say, well, just do a study. You know, do it as a study on hospital food because, you know, here's the costing. You know, every time someone comes into hospital with diabetes and they've got to do finger prick, that takes labour costs and whatever. Those, so those glucose monitors become cheap. Mm. So I say put a glucose monitor on every person with diabetes. And I tried to do it at my hospital, but probably it wasn't going to go ahead because I was going to prove that hospital food was crap and it was actually making everyone worse. Yeah, they don't want that. <laughs> But, you know, in hospital, you've got literally staff running around like headless chooks chasing someone's high blood glucose after mm. they've just been having a, a, a yeah. plate of rice and pasta and ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the, the labor costs just of that alone, apart from the health costs. It's, it's um, crazy. It's crazy. It's, and it's, I, I think we could, I think we could go on, you know, there's so many aspects of this that, that interplay and like, and I don't even, blame the met the hospital staff because they're just they're fighting their battle in the best way that they can but it needs to be that grassroots like change of the food pyramid you know change of the advice that's going out to actually make big impact well as i say we're, we're, we're doing a lot of energy in the space outside of the food guideline pyramid mm. because the people who are writing the food guidelines whether or not it's australia or the us are still compromised by history and vested interests I'm yeah. sorry, you know, I'm, I'm not slandering anyone. We can, you can look at their profiles. You can just say yeah. you, that it's hard for them to get out of their entrenched positions. Yeah. But where we've got a space is to actually recognise that actually those people with heart disease, with diabetes, with kidney disease specifically need different advice, which just happens to be low carb. Mm. And so we're actually in the process of actually working across those platforms and those groups to get them together without them knowing. And so yeah. we're doing that cross pollination, that breaking down of silos at the moment. And you know, there are cardiologists who are on board with this. There are kidney renal physicians. There are endocrinologists. There are neurologists. There are cancer specialists that are on board with this. They're still the minority, but I can guarantee when there are only a half dozen of us 15 years ago talking about it, we're not alone anymore. That was my. That, you know, I've literally found. And my position was, you know, Rod Taylor, who started Low Carb Down Under, I can still remember it, you know, years ago, 12 years ago, whatever, 
that four of us gave 20 minute presentations in his lounge room to a dozen people. Mm. And now that site's been, you know, that those lectures huge. have been sent yeah. tens, hundreds of millions of times. Mm. So, and that was critically important to me at that point in time. Rod rang me up and said, I heard you talking about sugar. What, mm. This is what I know. Can you, would you like to come across to Melbourne? So I said, next week and give a talk. Mm. So I literally hopped on a plane, went across to his lounge room and found, oh my God, I'm not alone anymore. And yeah. so that's, um, and, 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 you know, we're having this conversation now, you know, yeah. we're not alone. Yeah. Well, that's the only way stuff grows is by, by talking about it and find and making connections and, you know, forming groups and societies like you're doing and like getting that information out there. So it's, it's, it's super valuable, your work. And like, it's a very inspiring story for people to hear who are thinking of speaking up against these big dogmas and see that, you know, you've gone through an absolute ringer with it and you've come out the other side with most of your sanity intact. I'm and, still not good looking though. Yeah. <laughs> just keep going you might get there <laughs> so um but you know uh, you know incredible the work you're doing and you know i know you've got a play date with your granddaughter so i'm gonna let you go in a minute but if you spark some interest with people who haven't heard about you or, and want to understand more about your story and your journey where can they go and find more info about you i think um my talk blinders talks which I, again i got into trouble with the medical board for making it too simple <laughs> Yeah, I, I said, oh, you, you're making things too simple. I said, they are that simple, you know, just <laughs> stop it. Yeah, complicate it. But uh, it's on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of talks, yeah, they're still there. Uh, some of them will drift off onto different platforms over time. Uh, we're both on Twitter. I suppose that's where I'm most active. Um, you can find us on Facebook and uh, Instagram, but I don't spend much time there. I quite like Twitter because get a lot of communication people can learn a lot there it's not it's mm. not nearly an angry as angry a space as, as it used to be could be um i used to be attacked by the vegans i had a favorite thing that you know block a vegan a day yeah uh, that was <laughs> um and i actually don't mind look i i, I, I digress slightly again but I, vegans are actually they're on the right path you know they've got mm. an interest in their health and their environment whatever they've just fallen for the propaganda mm. and the vast, vast majority of them just don't realize that they're actually advocates for a religious group and they've fallen for it and ultimately a lot of them actually come back to start eating meat again and some of the people in this space in this low carb keto carnivore space uh when you speak to them are actually ex-vegans yeah you know, they just woke up and went, oh my goodness, this is actually wrong. They've gone down that path and they're actually very vocal about it. Yeah. No, I've seen, and, I've spoken, and, and, to, spoken to a few on, on this podcast and, and they actually go through these incredible health journeys where their health totally crashes. And it's yeah. like, they're on this positivity bias thing. It's like, it can't be the nutrition. It can't be the nutrition. It can't be the nutrition. Like veganism, <laughs> veganism is the healthiest diet around. And then finally they give in and then the health starts to improve again oh, the, there's a lot of high profile vegans who actually start eating meat again on youtube and they, they talk about that and i'm trying to find all those videos of those high profile carnivores that are going back to eating more vegetables yeah <laughs> not, not, not many around yeah <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're just not there you know it's, it's oh that have gone from eating meat to vegan they're just they're not there no um no. look, look it, it we've you we have to still laugh about it all. You've got to keep a sense of humor. Um, we've got to put it in perspective. And ultimately, it's about my health, my family's health. And if we can help the community's health along the way, then that's been that's that's a good legacy. Definitely. I love the message. Keep fighting the good fight. And um, it's been it a should, pleasure. It shouldn't be to a speak. fight, it should be a journey, shouldn't it? But anyway. Keep fighting the good journey. Keep keep <laughs> traveling the good journey. <laughs> that's the one. All right. But thank you so much, Gary. And we'll uh, speak again soon, I hope. Okay, Tim. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye.